All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. And this setup is actually mine. I used it before Biden, so it's not Biden's setup. And I'm not turning on the big lights because we are asked to keep the lights off if we can and AC is off. So that's why. Okay, so yesterday's talk, even when I did that over a phone, uh, was well received and then there were a lot of questions. So today we'll do two talks. One is this one where I'm going to go over the same study, but with my diagrams. How can I leave you alone until I show you what I drew and wrote? And then we would do a chit chat on both channels simultaneously. So you can watch wherever you like about the, about the same study. There were questions like, is it unvaccinated or unvaccinated? unvaccinated may not have long COVID, it must be a problem with the vaccinated. Then the questions, for example, would the long COVID, would we recover from that or not? I was heartbroken to see so many of the patients saying, I've been suffering from long COVID for a couple of years, or I'm giving up. So I want to make sure that regardless of this this quarreling about vaccine or not vaccine, we understand the data information and then in the chat we'll figure out how to answer your questions and to offer some hope for those who are suffering instead of just going you know just fighting so let's start so these are gifts for humanity and they're continuing and let me very quickly go over the links so this is drbean.com in the description there is a link to the drbean.com there are tons of premium content, and I have actually started doing one lecture every day in the morning for Dr. Bean as well, and these are beautiful new lectures that are coming in. And if you click on the link, I am sure you'll be shocked with that one-time price. So just check it out. Here is the study that we are going to go over. This is the case report, persistence of residual antigen. Look at the word they're using, residual antigen and RNA of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in tissue of two patients with long COVID. So it's a two patient series. And there were lots of comments as well that do you realize that it is a two patient series? It's not a study, it is anecdote. So <clears throat> anecdotes occur when there are observations. This is more than an anecdote. That is why the authors wrote it. That is why the frontiers uh, posted it and that is why there is news about it because there is evidence with it there is scientific evidence so this actually becomes the guide light for the next studies this is how science occurs science doesn't occur out of the blue so somebody says maybe we should check for this thing and they check that in one or two patients three four patients to figure out if that is happening or a doctor observes something and then says, this is something I'm observing and we should do a larger study on it. Then others do a re repeat of that. And that is how science works. It's not about anecdotes because it is too. Okay. Then there are some more references here as well. At the end in the description, I also have some links which I have gone over some of these studies before as well. There is a study here from the University of Minnesota that shows that even before vaccination, there were people who were suffering with long COVID. So I am not going to get into the quarrel of is it vaccine or not. The more important thing for me is to figure out together with, with our audience, with the cool beans, to figure out how do we solve this. So my own family members suffered about a year and gradually came out of these kind of issues. So I am very much dedicated to try to help it instead of fighting about it. So there are a few excerpts that I took from the article based on the questions that we had. One excerpt is here. This is for the patient one. They're saying having established the presence of the residual viral antigen. So they said residual antigen, that means pieces of virus maybe. And similarly, they use the term residual RNA. 
pieces of RNA? Maybe. Now, why do they use the word residual? The reason is that the RNA scope that they're using, the, the test that they're using is in the US and the patients were in Singapore. So they would take patients' tissue, freeze it and send it to US for testing. And they write in their limitation that we were then not able, able to prove viable virus because the tissue was frozen and flown over the international boundaries. They said it would have been a great opportunity if we could have fresh tissue and then look at viable virus in it. Having said that, keep in mind that 426 days later, viral RNA present in the tissues outside the cells and inside the cells can generally be because there is active viral replication going on. Second thing, they were not looking only for spike protein because if it was about spike protein, then that could become confused with vaccine as well because spike can be generated by vaccine. They, they looked at spike protein and nucleocapsid protein. So that means this this residue was from the infection. Then the third question becomes, somehow vaccine caused it or caused the infection to become long COVID? That is actually not a correct uh, understanding. Okay, so back here. Using RNA scope in C2 hybridization, we detected viral RNA with both extracellular and intracellular spaces. This is very important. Outside the cell and inside the cell. So you could say, if it is not an active virus, you could say that it may have RNA pieces stuck inside the cells. There is going to be no way that RNA can be outside of the cells for 400 days. So the uh, of the appendix, providing evidence of viral persistence for up to 446 days. So they do then make this claim that this is the evidence of viral persistence. Why is this study different from other conjectures that viral proteins are present? <clears throat> like Dr. Bruce Patterson and team's work. This is a study in long COVID patients, study or case series in long COVID patients. And the connection they are trying to make, the authors, is that it seems like in long COVID patients, some of them, because long COVID has so many phenotypes, it seems like in long COVID patients, some of the patients have their gastrointestinal tract or GIT or gut acting as a reservoir, maybe because of gut biome dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is when the gut biome becomes dysregulated allowing the virus to start persisting there. And from there, the virus, that becomes the base station for the virus, and then it keeps attacking the rest of the body. That is what the authors think. For me, there is an other very important thing for long haulers, and that is gut dysbiosis, and to keep an eye on that. Especially those long haulers that have gut-related symptoms. Okay, so continuing here. The so let's go to the second patient. This is the paragraph for the second patient. Here they say, breast tissue was obtained from the patient 170 days after the symptom on onset. Now the 175 days after the symptoms onset was September of 2020. So I believe she had the infection in March of 2020. And then breast tissue resection was in September of 2020. So this is way before the vaccine, number one. Number two, for both of the patients, the other patient also had the first infection in 2020. So that was in pre-vaccine time. However, her tissue collection was in May of 2021, which was vaccine time because December 2020 is when the vaccine started. So she may or may not have had the vaccine. The article does not talk about vaccine at all. 
I was actually trying to see if I could call the authors today before this lecture and ask them, but I just could not find their, their numbers. Email communication can take days. Okay, so 175 days after symptoms onset, further to investigate the presence of viral antigens and RNA in non-GIT tissues. So this second patient had the virus present in her breast tissue. And again, within the breast, inside the tissue cells and outside the cells and inside the Im immune system cells, especially monocytes and macrophages. So if we just wanted to stop right here now, there is just two important messages to carry. It seems like virus can be sitting in macrophages and monocytes. And that is where the research should be expanded further. And secondly, it seems like GIT is the main harbor for this virus to hide and then from there to continue to attack. Okay, so moving on. So if you see here, viral nuclear uh, protein and spike protein, nucleocapsid protein and spike protein and protein, was detected and observed in the tumor adjacent area. So somebody asked this question yesterday, that was the virus in the tumor cells? They say tumor adjacent area, that is next issue around it, not the tumor. These viral antigens also co-localized with myeloid and macrophage markers. These markers here, CD68, CD206, and CD169 are macrophages. CD14 is monocyte. Viral RNA was also detected in the breast within both the extracellular space of the tissue and within the cells. This is very important. RNA sticking inside the cell could be hidden. What is the RNA doing outside the cells? It is being produced somewhere and then coming out. So then finally, they also say this, that is very interesting. This is a, these excerpts, I put them at the top based on the questions I saw in the comments. So this one, they say that, look, in a recent paper, investigating the association between SARS-CoV-2 viral persistence and long COVID, patients negative for mucosal SARS-CoV-2 RNA, 30%, did not experience long COVID. Th this is a very important point here. What they're saying is they're referring a different study where that study said those who did not have viral RNA in their mucosa, these are the wet surfaces, for example, the GIT surfaces, the mouth and the intestine and the nose and the conjunctiva and let's say the um, urethra, vagina. These are all wet surfaces. These are mucosal surfaces. They say when they found that a patient did not have the viral RNA in their mucosal cells, then that patient also did not have long COVID symptoms. On the other hand, those patients who had tested positive for the viral RNA in their mucosal cells, which was 70% of the study, in those patient majority, 65.5% of the 70% had long COVID as well. This is really important. And they say it, the authors say, that we are the first study or case series to show persistent or demonstrate the evidence of persistent virus in long COVID patients. Then they say these findings not only support the above notion of viral persistence, look, they, they're now using the word virus, viral persistence in the GIT, gastrointestinal tract, but also additionally associated viral persistence with long COVID symptoms. So, and if you have any questions, please hold on to them. After this discussion, we will do another live talk and we would answer or try to answer whatever I can. I can't claim to be able to answer all questions, but whatever I could. Now, <laughs> these were the things I put them up front based on the questions. Here is what I had actually prepared. So let's very quickly go over there. Two patients, both women, 
One was, I believe, 40 years. The other one was 45 years. This 45 years was immunosuppressed as well because she had breast cancer. This one not. They both had their first infection in the early part of 2020. That means they got hit by the original Wuhan variant. This woman, patient number one, 426 days later in her appendix and in her, what was the other tissue? Skin. In her appendix and skin, she demonstrated or she had the evidence of the viral proteins and the RNA. This woman, September 2020, before vaccine time, 175th day after her primary infection, she had the viral RNA and the viral NP proteins and spike proteins in her breast tissue, as I said before, in the cells, outside the cells. And they both, in addition, had the long COVID symptom. And guess this, the long COVID symptoms were mostly GIT symptoms. Nausea, anorexia, abdominal pain, diarrhea. They both were long COVID for abdomen. Conclusion, they said we saw skin, breast, GIT to be having the viral persistence. Immune suppressed patient can experience long COVID more. So there is another study that showed that those patients who are immunosuppressed, they tend to have long COVID more than those who are not. GIT is the possible reservoir. And this is something that is scary for me. It seems that SARS-CoV-2 directly targets macrophages. Now, I wanted to uh, provide one more statement here. When we look at these studies or case reports, it doesn't mean this happens to everyone. <clears throat> if it would have happened to everyone, the same thing, then either everyone would have been asymptomatic or everyone will be mild or everyone will be moderate, or everyone will be severe, or all of us would die with the virus. That does not happen. So that means when we talk about macrophages being targeted, it's not necessary it is happening to everyone. But whomever it is happening to, they are in a miserable state. And it is my, I have taken it up on myself to work for them to figure out how can I provide more education. Continuing, I don't want to waste your time. We'll do a chit chat as well. Details, case report number one, 7th March, 2020, she became positive, 44 years old. I kept calling her 40 years, 44 years old. She must like me, I called her 40 years. She had, she presented the first time with migraine headaches, 37.3 degree centigrade fever, pharyngitis, nausea, so throat issues, choking and bronchospasm, breathing issues, dyspnea, breathing issues. Anosmia, anosmia and agusia, uh, loss of smell and taste, distaste, anorexia, no hunger, diarrhea, expectoration, phlegm from the cough, with the cough, chills in the spinal cord, platelet, uh, palate petechiae. So if you open the mouth, that is a palate, and in, this, in the roof of the mouth, there were tiny, small dots, which are an indication of the small vessel vasculitis because the small little blood vessels are inflamed they are swollen and they're bursting because their perm permeability is increased and then there are tiny uh, hemorrhages these are petechiae she also had 8.5 percent weight loss she also presented later on with so here let's just look at this so that was 11 may she was and she became PCR negative by 11 May 2020. 11 May 2020, she became PCR negative. One year later, in May of 2021, now did she get a vaccine during this time, this one year? I do not know. They have not mentioned vaccine at all. So she came to the hospital with nausea, loss of appetite, and generalized abdominal pain. These are the signs for a surgeon or a doctor to say, you know what, we need to figure out something going on with your intestine. Is it blocked? Do we have intersusception? Do we have some other GIT issues? Do we have appendicitis? So they would open up the abdomen and then 
if they open the abdomen, normally they'll say, you know what, let's just remove the appendix as well. So they did a generalized, they did an urgent exploratory laparotomy. That is, they did not know what's going on, so let's open the abdomen and see. And they decided to do appendectomy as well. So they removed the appendix. So when they were, <laughs> excuse me, when they were doing this surgery and the prep, for the prep, the woman was PCR negative. When they did the surgery, so now remember, PCR negative is very interesting that her mucosal surfaces, nose and throat, did not have the virus. At least didn't have the RNA of the virus. However, when they collected her appendix and they took a biopsy of her lower legs because she had the dermatitis, they took the biopsy of the skin of the lower legs. In these tissues, they were able to see the viral RNA and the viral nucleocapsid protein and the spike protein. And not only that, they saw the monocyte and macrophages to be involved. And this is what I want to show you before I continue the diagrams. So this is the history, one of the diagram in this article. You can actually go to the article and see it. This is that history. This is the diagram, beautiful diagram. So here, this is appendix, and this is, I believe, skin. I believe this is the patient number one. So the way to look at this diagram is, so if you look at this cluster of six diagrams, DAPI, this diagram is staining a marker. This is also a marker. This is CD45 marker. So this is the various immune cells marker, for example. Then this is COVID nucleocapsid protein marker. Then this is CD68, which is, I believe, monos uh, macrophage. And then this is composite. When they combine them all, in this diagram here, these places that they are showing, these are showing the presence of the viral RNA and viral um, and proteins. Similarly, so this is appendix that the cells outside the cells and the immune system cells in the appendix. And then similarly in the skin, the, if you see here, this composite diagram here, I do not know if I can make it bigger. I can. This composite diagram shows these green dots are the viral proteins. They are present in this skin around the blood vessel. So that is why the patient has the perivascular dermatitis. So skin flare-up, skin redness, skin um, itchiness, burning sensation, micro, uh, uh, sorry, what is that? Micro neuropathies, that all can happen because of this presence. And then down here, once again, if you see these little markers are showing the presence of the viral proteins outside the cells and inside the cells. So this is patient number one. I believe this is patient number two. This is her breast tissue uh, scan, or oh, sorry, tissues scans. And once again, if you look at the composite, the viral RNA and proteins are present inside the cells, outside the cells, and present in her breast tissue. And if you see here, the markers, this is, I think, outside the cell, these are inside the cells. That, that was fascinating for me to see. I saw it for the first time. If you were aware of it, more power to you. But this is the first evidence I saw of a possibility of viral persistence. Now, we discussed this. <clears throat> we discussed this as well. Second case report. Same thing, 45 years of age. She has ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, she presented the first time when she had the infection. That was on 14th March 2020. So that is also Wuhan time. Headache, upper stomach pain, nausea, diarrhea, myalgia, fatigue, became PCR positive. Symptoms kept worsening for two months. She was immunocompromised as well. 8 May 2020, she became PCR negative. 
However, the symptoms continue to persist. Then, here if you see, in September of 2020, September 2020, before the vaccine times, she needed a partial breast resection and margin control surgery. They did that. She was PCR positive when they, she came in for the surgery. This was 175 days later. And then the tissues that they collected, I just showed you the diagrams. Tissues had the virus. This is the tumor. Tumor didn't have the virus, or at least they don't mention it. But the remaining tissues, especially the macrophages and monocytes, and the outside spaces between the cells, these had the virus proteins. So <clears throat> they say that, nevertheless, we believe that these two cases are the first. So they say we agree that it is a small case series of two people. Nevertheless, we believe that these two cases are the first to report detected viral antigen and or RNA in the tissue of patients with long COVID. Despite the lack of definitive consensus on the underlying pathophysiology of long COVID, emerging evidence suggests that long COVID is associated with gut dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is when the gut, any time when normal flora normal flora is the normally uh, normal living organisms in us and all of us have a different composition of them when that normal pattern concentrations become disrupted then that is called dysbiosis viruses can do that one bacterium can do that clostridium difficile for example antibiotics can do that various kinds of foods can do that so they say that this is possibly the gut dysbiosis caused by the virus and then aberrant immune activation in response to the residual virus. This is, this is a huge deal. I'll tell you why it is a huge deal for me. I, <coughs> excuse me, I had been of the opinion that the virus lives somewhere in us, this SARS-CoV-2. But I was not able to find the evidence. And so I had to stay as far as Dr. Bruce Patterson's team had said, and that is that, hey, spike proteins carried in the monocytes. But the kind of issues that long COVID patients are having, some of them, are not just all explainable by immune dysregulation. What is continuously poking the immune system? I have had these discussions a couple of uh, one and a half year ago as well. This is the first study that actually grounds me to say there is a potential to try to find virus in the tissues as well. And in this, one woman is immunocompromised. So yeah, sure, immunocompromised patients can have viral persistence for a long time. But healthy patient... Again, that is a case of one. But with evidence, we should repeat this. So then they say a growing body of evidence also suggests and supports the possibility that GIT may serve as a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in both convalescent and long COVID patients. Then, this is the last part of the discussion, they say, future studies should confirm our observations. Being a case report, there are limitations of our study. It's a case report. The study, <coughs> I'm so sorry. So she came in, um, our cleaning crew, um, she came in and did the cleaning. And after she went, Luffy's hair were actually everywhere. So I don't know what happened, the vacuum or something, the air just blew the Luffy's hair on everything. Anyways, and I've been coughing since yesterday now. Um, because a case, being a case report, there are limitations of our study. The study comprises of a small N number of two patients, and therefore, given their diagnoses, our findings likely do not reflect majority of long COVID patients. Additionally, Fresh tissue and blood samples were not collected to for follow-up studies. As a result, we were also unable to determine 
viral viability as the virus would be inevitably destroyed during tissue fixation for international transport. Addition of a control group comprising convalescent COVID-19 patients without long COVID and a residual virus would be advantageous as well. Despite our previous report of residual SARS-CoV-2 present in convalescent COVID-19 patients without long COVID symptoms for up to 180 days, and I mentioned that study before, we established that residual viral RNA and or antigen could be present for much longer for up to 426 days. So that is the discussion. Thank you very much for listening in. There are some links in the description. What I'm going to do is after this talk, I'll hang out, hang up. Five minutes later, I'll come back live on both YouTube channels. So whoever want to join from wherever. Um, please like, subscribe and share. And there are links in the description if you would like to support this work. And I want to thank Anne Ong for her continuous support. Even today, I received a check from her. So Anne, thank you very much. Although nowadays the support has really reduced, and that's okay. Uh, COVID is also going away, which is a good news. Uh, if you would like to support, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee, or you can use PayPal, or you can become a Substack member. You can buy an access to Dr. Bean or access to YouTube. With this, um, would you like to continue, have a chit chat and a discussion about this study, or? You want to pass. Totally your, I'm going to hang up and just wait for your comments. And so if you would say, I'll come back online. And love you all as well.